So welcome. Good to see you today. <laughs> Good to see you too, Roland. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for doing this. It's of been a course. while since we've done it, and uh, I'm so happy. I'm so pleased that you're the you're the first one in a in a while, first one of the year as well. It's great to have you here. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love us to start by just simply, if you would, um, saying who you are, uh, your pronouns, um, and what you do at the college. Uh, I'd love to hear, even if it's just like a, a word or two, too, about, uh, yeah, how you would describe the work that you do at the college. Okay. Yeah, great. My name is Luis Miguel Guerrero. I use he and they pronouns. I am also a, a proud class of 2020 alum at the college. I am in the Inclusion and Diversity Office in Student Affairs. Uh, and that also um, relates to my role. I am the Assistant Director of Inclusion and Diversity in Student Affairs. Um, the work that I do on campus is energizing. You said three words, Roland, let's see. Oh, just, yeah, like, yeah. In, in, a, in a few words, like, or briefly, yeah, however you would describe your work so far. Yeah, uh, energizing, diverse, and welcoming. Yeah. And would you say anything like so far, I know you're new to the position. Um, what do you enjoy about your job so far? So I was previously over at Student Activities and while we are very student facing on the daily, I was like, you know, I really want to be involved in those spaces on 30 College Street or along College Street that are outside of 30, but also, um, stretch far and wide to the student body. So getting involved in these centers, I was really enthusiastic about uh, joining this team uh, because mm. it meant even more one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with students. Yeah, yeah, of course. But tends to be, I think, most meaningful to a lot of us. Um, well, thanks again so much, Lewis, for, for joining us in this Elephant in the Room interview series. Um, just for, those who might be new listeners um, uh, or audience members to this um, series. Um, I am Roland Mendiola. I use he, him pronouns. I serve as director of counseling and wellness services and uh, a clinical psychologist on staff. And um, we started these a couple of years ago with um, the intention of just of course, like always building more awareness around mental health issues, but really also trying to um, destigmatize, um, demystify mental health in our lives by particularly talking to um, staff members. And we're gonna start interviewing some faculty members as well um, about mental health, um, but staff and faculty members that students interact with every day, every week, um, and particularly along this intersection of culture and identity um, and, um, and success, uh, the meaning that people attribute to um, both mental health and success in their lives. So that's, that's, um, that's the plan so far. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, we'll get we'll get right into it. Let me know if you need any, if you have any clarifying questions at all while we go along. But the first question we start off with is, did you grow up, Lewis, um, talking about mental or emotional health in your family, in your communities? If not, why not? And if so, in what ways? I'll begin with uh, no. <laughs> uh, in my family, what was that? I'll begin with a resounding no. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I would too, I would too. Um, so in my family, I think uh, growing up uh, low income and uh, in a family of persons of color um, and immigrants as well, my parents being both from Mexico and immigrating at a young age, um, I think our uh, circumstances didn't always allow for that, almost like the spatial 
emotional energy to, to invest in our emotions, to be like checking in on one another. Um, so it was kind of this like background, um, that never made it to the forefront of, uh, our agendas or our day to day. Um, and, um, it would sometimes come up in, um, conversations like after Sunday service, mm. after mass, um, on like, oh, that was an interesting reading today. Um, how did that make us feel? Or like, let's mm. talk about it. Like that, that might've been something that we, um, you know, touched upon on, in terms of like mental health and emotions. Um, mm -hmm. But I really do think that growing up, religion was the extent of our um, tuning in to, hey, how, how did that make you feel? Or um, how, how did that have an impact on you? But um, aside from that, I think it, it had always been a struggle to, to talk about it. And another big piece of the puzzle, I believe, is uh, my parents never had that encouragement to share their emotional vulnerability uh, growing up. Um, that um, I think that also played a role in uh, my siblings and I not uh, fully expressing to each other um, or checking in with one another on how we really felt. Yeah. Yeah, that very much resonates. And my general sense, my ongoing sense is that this is so common for so many families. And is that is that your experience as well, more or less what you're describing, the religious piece, the generational pieces? Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. that's also my impression. Um, would you say, Lewis, that you were aware of these things while you were growing up? That, oh, we don't talk about these things, or like, oh, we'll talk about it after Sunday Mass or something. Were, was that clear enough for you as, as a child, would you say? I think being the youngest and the, the only boy in my family, I was like, wait, we should be more in tune to like, how are you like, and in our world, as Keith Stern says, how are you comma really? <laughs> and right. I think my own variation was like, not how are you comma really, but like, hey, how's it going? What's up? Or in Spanish, like, ¿Qué estás haciendo? Or, you know, like, ¿Cómo estás? And yeah. um, being the younger, the, the youngest sibling in my family, I'd always like pester almost my, my older sisters and my parents like, hey, like, can we actually talk about this like now? And <laughs> um, so I think, um, you know, as time went on, um, we, we started to talk about it a little bit more. Um, yeah. And I, I do think it's like a work in progress where we're getting, we're, we're building more traction. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that these past couple of years, like given uh, social difference and uh, yes. social movements um, and with the pandemic being another added layer to uh, the happenings in our world and in our country um, that we've really had to make the conscious effort of checking in on one another on hey, maybe like this is language that we've used in, in the past or maybe our family members have used in the past. Um, how, did the, how does this actually make us feel? And is this the language that we want to see in the world that we want to live in? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I really also appreciate, Louis, you mentioning this piece about like being low income, being an immigrant family, um, in a way, I know you didn't just say it was this, but um, we didn't have like the space to talk about these things. Like there wasn't almost like the bandwidth emotionally and yeah, just like energy wise to be able to go there. And that's very real for a lot of people. So I don't, I don't raise these issues or questions lightly because I recognize like some it's very limited or restricted in ways um, because of people's circumstances. Right. Like I, I definitely do have vivid memories, you know, even like as a kindergartner, as a first grader, my parents uh, were the owners of a small local grocery store. Mm. And even then, like, I, I remember wanting to like, how can I contribute to the family or check in on my parents? Yeah. Yeah. And 
my my impression then, um, you know, just as a little kid, based on your observance, uh, observe, observing, observing your family member, um, your observation. There we go. <laughs> um, I I was always like, well. I want to check in on them, but they seem very like emotionally pulled into finances yeah. Um, yeah. that, you know, t- talking about like, oh, what are we doing this weekend would be like, that's not priority right now. Like we need to sell. Right. So sometimes when I'm talking about these kinds of things, sometimes helpful to ask the question like, or think of things in terms of like these unwritten or unspoken rules that or norms that you know um, were a part of in these families or cultures. Would you name any of those, or do any any specifically come to mind for you, Lewis? As far as like, so yeah, we were operating in this way based on some of these unspoken ex- expectations. Mm. I think uh, given our family's Mexican culture, um, a big part of it growing up was also gender roles. Mm -hmm. And um, finding that my sisters were were also my parents in a sense. Right. So because we, the four of us are all first generation, having each other to check in emotionally on everything, whether it was like friends or like after school clubs and how's your school work going? Like, um, you know, what, what was it like studying for that exam? Um, and just making sure that we would lift each other up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think a big part of it was, yeah, the, the gender roles of my dad wanting to be the strong figure and never really talking about his emotions. Um, And almost that reflected onto myself as well. Like, you shouldn't talk about like what you're feeling, but why are you doing that with your sisters? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, through my siblings and I bonding, almost helping my parents uh, have that liberty to find that for themselves as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that also resonates. And I feel like it's an explanation for why my family also evolved over time is they were able to see different ways of being as well. Yeah. Um, So thank you, Lewis. Um, How might you think about mental, emotional health issues now in your life? I think that they're at the forefront. Yeah. 100%. I think my transition to college here at Bowdoin specifically, I went to an all guys uh, Catholic high school in the suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah, Milwaukee, though. Milwaukee. Oh, close enough, though. Midwest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> um, and like at the time, I, um, my senior year of high school, I, I wanted to explore those uh, parts of my identity that I was like, well, I don't really have like the words for this or like what I'm feeling or like, am I able to explore my identity? And it wasn't until I got to, to Brunswick and here to campus that I was like, wait, you, you have agency, like you're, you're an adult and you can um, charter your own adventure from here on out. Um, and uh, that took shape in really exploring my uh, my queerness and my my intersectionality with my faith um, and just being whole, um, figuring out what uh, what being whole meant for, for myself. And um, that all uh, has some layers to it as well with um, mental health as to not avoid it, but encourage it to uh, your everyday life because it's it's a part of who we are. Yeah. How would you describe Lewis? That that's really well said. Thank you. Um, how would you describe, in your mind, the connection between wholeness and 
mental health well-being. Mm. For some reason, the word present is coming up for me. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's it's having that in tuneness, almost like mind, body, soul, and spirit of um, okay, I'm I'm here. Um, Yeah, being in tune in in all uh, in all aspects of the word. So really, like the sensory, like I yeah. I start my day by okay, like this is the weather, and you know, like this past week that we've had like a really rainy week. I'm like, mm -hmm. although it's kind of dreary and moody, like we're rolling with it. It's part of life, and the earth also needs to be rejuvenated. And just like the earth, I also need to be nurtured. And how can mm -hmm. I do that for myself today? Mm -hmm. um, and um, yes. yeah, I think the sensory aspect of it, um, yeah, tuning into like what is actually felt here and paying attention to your mind mm -hmm. as well. Like, mm -hmm. how can I align everything so that I am able to be present for myself, but for others around me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I love this, Lewis, and I can't wait for students to listen to this, hopefully. Um, yes, and of course, my then follow-up to this, and I know we could spend hours and days even going through this, but um, can you walk me even through some of your journey to that? Because, right, like, you know, we go from like, oh, this is where we started in my emotional life, my emotional upbringing, right? And then to that. Like, how did you get from there to there, there to here? Right. Um, that's a great, great point. It's not always linear and it's not always easy. Um, I'm grateful that um, my high school environment, while very um, Catholic and religious and uh, helping build those principles, of uh, these are our, our um, beliefs as Catholics. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's some like weight to that as well, especially with the sure. LGBTQ com community. Sure. Um, I've, um, in my transition, like coming to Bowdoin, I've really leaned, leaned into the fact that um, I am able to decide for myself and dictate for myself what spirituality and my faith means for myself yeah. and not have someone else um, almost like put a damper on my party or my faith or my, my spirit and how yeah. I show up every day right? Um, based on their perceptions of me, but how I choose to live my life. Mm. Um, and I do think that, um, again, going back to my high school, almost nourishing of, of faith mm. um, yeah. and my transition to Bowdoin, I am grateful for both of them being so transitory and smooth um, that I was able to nurture over the four years of high school, my faith and over the four years at Bowdoin, the combination of my queerness and my faith yeah. um, and almost like really tap into um, freedom, uh -huh. liberty, yeah. um, and, uh, embodying that, um, again, I am able to, to decide for myself. We all have the agency, um, to, to live our days, uh, to the extent that we'd like to live them. And for me, I try to live a life where I'm able to, be happy for myself, but again, um, expand that for, for others, because, uh, as a practicing Catholic, mm -hmm. I, I think Jesus overall message was one of love. And, um, I, I can't think of any faith that wants to be exclusionary. Um, when the overall lining of it is connect with others, especially those who are in most need, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm smiling a lot here because uh well just so appreciate you, Lewis. And and also that um yeah, I feel like 
in sort of mainstream culture, I feel like we could have for, yeah, we could have a whole interview just on this topic, but I feel like in mainstream culture, we just get this very narrow slice of what religion means to people. And it's very like almost black and white. Hmm. Um, and what you're describing, I also can resonate with in terms of how, at least within certain environments amongst certain people, like religious um, or religiosity can instill like a, a meaningful sense of um, meaning and spirituality and just kind of, yeah, just a general sense of faith, which I think you're speaking to really well that it can instill this sense of like inquiry, even like you were saying into like, what do I actually believe? Um, and that can be really extremely valuable in my experience. But I, I think we don't always get that uh, window into ways that religious institutions can provide something. Right, yeah. right. Um, this is great, thank you, Louis. Um, this isn't like a huge departure, but kind of a, a little bit in a different direction, but connected to mental health in my, in my experience almost intrinsically. Um, how would you say, uh, going off of how you think about mental health, how do you think about success in your life, Louis? Um, and then if I can add like a couple <laughs> multiple parts to that question, how has that changed over time and how does it relate to mental health in your experience? Definitely. What does success mean to you in life? And that could, you can interpret that any way you like. Success in any domain or in any regard really. It used to be, um, how are my papers? How are my grades? <laughs> You know, as, you, as you're growing up, you're like, wait, this is my like big stressor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it definitely was for me, again, being the youngest, I was like, well, I have three amazing sisters who they are my role models. Like I need to meet the bar. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, and success uh, for a long time was, uh, I would even say up to getting my, my degree here at Bowdoin. Um, okay, but like, how am I performing? Mm -hmm. um, how am I being active or lack thereof? What could I be doing better? Um, and I would say it's definitely transitioned from, again, that, that time in high school to college to while at Bowdoin, thinking about like, yes, grades are important here. Yes, my overall goal is to graduate and I yep. get my degree and have a major. Um, sure. But also backing up and thinking about what's actually important for me. Um, and this definitely intersects with uh, my exploring of identities and in terms of faith and my queerness. Um, but when I was really thinking about it uh, while I was a student here at Bowdoin, I, I came to the conclusion that what mattered more, most um, were my relationships. And that includes my friends, my family, people that I, you know, might even have a transactional relationship with at like the grocery store or at the gas station, but seeing humanity in people. And I think, uh, and I don't know, even these, these past couple of years uh, are especially coming to mind, but how people can be so dismissive of one another, but it's important to see everyone for their, their contribution and their presence here. Um, I think it's also a, a big part of uh, my faith, but just thinking about how um, there is a, a Mexican saying that uno nunca es eterno, which is mm -hmm. no one is eternal. Like we're only here for a smidgen of time. And um, like thinking about that, I'm like, well, when I'm older, whenever, you know, <laughs> whenever that comes, I'd like to look back and mm -hmm. think about how successful uh, yeah. my life was and what does that mean for me right and success for me is being emotionally present um mm. and feeling like I've given everything 
to my undertakings, my endeavors day to day, but feeling that I've, I've made a difference in my life. Thank you. I appreciate that. So that when you look back on your life, you'll, you'll feel it, it has been a success if it's, if you've had those things in place. Exactly. Yeah. Can I ask you just even a little uh, specific piece about what you just said? Because sure. um, I think a lot of, and that's the reason why I wanted to include some of these kind of questions for students to hear about success. Um, because I'll often hear students really a genuine desire to make a difference. Um, at this point, you know, no right answer, of course. Like, what does that mean to you? Making mm. I've definitely thought about this too. Um, you know, since coming back uh, to campus uh, in my capacity as an employee, yeah. I've, I've uh, taken that on to mean, how can I support um, specifically students that might have uh, these challenges that I grew up with or students that also have uh, diverse identities that I might not specifically represent, but how can we get them uh, that feeling of representation on campus? And more broadly, how can we build on that locally in mm. the state, in the country, in the world? Um, and so that's, come to specifically mean um, supporting uh, our uh, college uh, students here at Bowdoin. Um, and what really excites me is the fact that um, at least within these past couple of weeks and uh, as we've started off the fall semester, uh, seeing that like wave of new energy and mm -hmm. uh, excitement to engage with social difference and varying perspectives that Although I didn't graduate that long ago, I'm like, this is amazing. Like we, we need to be here to support the students that are going to be the leaders of like tomorrow, which is cheesy to say, but you know, these are students here right now that are mm -hmm. going to be in public office, that are going to be uh, big corporate companies that are going to make a difference financially, socially across the board. Yeah. And we, we are able to have that impactful role on these lives uh, to help them get there. And uh, my older sister is also uh, an alumna of, of Bowdoin College. Oh, and, didn't know that. Um, so she was a, a class of 20, 2012 uh, graduate. And wow. um, when I, you know, as a student was struggling or, you know, think about, thinking about like finding my place here at Bowdoin, or really going through it, thinking about like the stressors of an exam or a paper, I would always think to myself, okay, yes, I appreciate like Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow and uh, you know Joshua Chamberlain, Harriet Beecher Stowe, all of the big prominent figures that have walked the uh, the concrete uh, of the quad and all. I'm like, well, yes, we have so many of these influential individuals that have been here and occupied these spaces, we also have so many more, like the history that has uh, run through these halls and uh, campus, like extends to Martin Luther King and uh, to current uh, representatives of public office. Uh, mm -hmm. But even more special for myself was that grounding point that I was like, Again, while I, I acknowledge all of these wonderful individuals that have been on campus, my guiding stone is that my family has walked these paths, that my sister has been able to uh, be a first generation graduate at the college. She did not have it easy. I didn't have it easy, but we've made it through. Yeah. And uh, we're able to uh, even in the thick of it, uh, support one another and uplift each other. Hmm. I can, I feel it. I feel it as you say it. Like, and I feel the goosebumps and, and I feel the energy you're talking about moving in different ways on campus. And I feel your excitement about it as you're talking about it, which is, which is great, really. Um, thank you, Lewis. My, 
my last question for you, the way we typically wrap up, um, you know, with uh, students on our minds, of course, um, from your experience, both as a student and now as an employee here, what kind of message feels important for students to get uh, or feels important for you to convey to students about well-being and success in the times that we're, I guess, particularly in the times we're living in today and all that they have to deal with, I guess we could say too. That's a great question. <laughs> I'd say definitely use every faculty and staff resource on campus and take advantage of us. Um, we're here to help. Uh, I know it can be intimidating. Um, I once lived it and was like, yeah. oh my gosh, like, am I going to bore them? Or like, is this... Uh, okay for me to do or drop by. It is absolutely okay to come by and schedule a meeting with us. Um, it might be intimidating at first, but um, a big piece that might also help, um, I would have my best friend come with me. Um, you know, I, I was like, today I'm feeling a little bit more anxious. And she was like, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, is there anything I could do to help? And it also was a big learning piece for me of like, okay, it's important to be vulnerable. It's also important to lean into your community, to your support system when Absolutely. you need help. Yeah. Um, and I'm eternally grateful for her um, showing up for me when I needed her most on campus. And um, mm. I was like, would you walk me over to office hours? Like I, I need help with this paper, but I'm intimidated by, you know, visiting, uh, would you come? me and we would take like a little break and walk over together and I'd do the same you know whenever we needed each other but um definitely seek out faculty and staff resources um and that's across the board like athletics I'm sure is also very enthusiastic to get students of all abilities and uh levels of skill in whatever sport it is uh to introduce them to what it might be that they're interested in um yeah, um, yeah, and I guess the last big piece that I'd also share um, is this is also super cheesy, but I'm okay with cheese. So me too. I think we need more cheese, more. right? <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> um, but bring, it, about, bring the cheese. Bring the cheese. I'm gonna bring it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thinking about how, um, you know, we were just talking about like before this, uh, before our recording here, our conversation, uh, how I first stepped uh, foot on campus to self-explore Bowdoin for myself through uh, Explore Bowdoin. Yeah. And one of the big pieces that uh, called uh, my attention was, well, would you look at that? Like this college has an offer of the college and, um, like really reading into it. And uh, I would say over my flight back home to Chicago um, in my bookmark, I was like, hmm, let's entertain this for a second. And what really stood out to me was uh, the line about connection to place and finding nature a familiar friend. Mm. And again, like um, if you're from the city, like, like I am, I, I grew up uh, in Chicago or wherever you might come from. Um, I was like, well, do I actually see myself here, like in Maine? Um, how is this going to like fit in my life? Because this is very different from what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, and I'd say really leaning into uh, the offer because there is there's a tenant in there. There's a line for you. There's an offer for you mm -hmm. that will stand out. And when you want to find purpose or meaning, reread the offer of the college and maybe highlight, maybe sit with it, maybe, you know, go for a walk in the commons, find your buddy, find what feels like home on campus and run with that. Hold on to it um, because that's how I um, was able to find a stronger mm -hmm. uh, and still do, um, living here in Brunswick, 
uh, mm. find that connection to um, not only place, but finding that intertwining to mental health and mind, body, soul, spirit connection for myself. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I feel that. And then I also um, almost see that as your way of like seeing yourself as a already having a place here, like that, that there was something to connect the two of you together, you and Bowdoin. You know, like Bowdoin has a place for me, I have a place for Bowdoin. And that, I, I really, I really appreciate that. Wow, thank you, Lewis. I so appreciate you um, and, and who you are and, and what you do and what you bring to this community. And I'm so excited for you to be in this position and have the, the kind of uh, impact you can have and will have. Um, so yeah, much, much appreciation and thank you again for doing this. And I wanna encourage anyone who has a chance to listen to this to, to seek Lewis out spend some time with this amazing person and, and, uh, and yeah, like have a chance to, to learn and to share. And, and um, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend it enough. Thank so, you for having me, Roland. Um, absolutely. Hope we can do it again, some kind of way. And um, yeah, I think it's a great, great start. Great kickoff to the year on these. So thanks. Awesome. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Hope you enjoy yourself. Do you have anything, anything uh, you're looking forward to this weekend? So the Common Ground Fair is happening, and I might take a little trip up to Unity, Maine. Okay. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, enjoy it. Okay. Thank you, Roland. Great to see you, Lewis. All Good right. To see you as well. I'll talk to you soon. Thank right. you. Bye bye.